friends, my name is Warren Hoyt. I've been a Bible teacher and pastor and sort of a missionary for a lot of years. And I want to welcome you to this next teaching that I'm doing. This is a series of teaching on the topic of uh, biblical or Christian education. And in the first teaching, I told you about how I got introduced to this theme and why I think it's important. Then in the second one, we just looked at um, how God actually educated or discipled Israel. Uh, that was the first discipled nation and how that was, it was really a biblical education he gave them that blessed them and made them different from other nations. Now in this teaching, I want to go on from there and talk about how the nations of Western Europe were discipled. Um, we know that in the book of Acts, it tells us about the progression of the gospel toward the West. I found out in the seminary that the gospel also went to the East that those in those same years were just not told that part of it. But um, it had a particular impact in, in Europe, in, in Western Europe, and it really shaped what we call Western civilization. So I want to look at that. And first, I want to discuss with you, um, I want you to think about this. Have you noticed, you know, different regions of the world, they're, they're very different in, in the, uh, the way they live and the results that they get. And I think without a doubt, we can say that some regions of the world do better than others. I watch a lot of international news. I see things going on in Africa and Asia and the Middle East and, and so forth. And it's quite different. Uh, and you can just tell the standard of living is so different. And if you just look closely at the videos, there's a lot of reasons for that. And I know there are. And so I don't want you to argue with me, those of you who want to tell me all these other reasons for it. Um, geography is one of the biggest reasons for differences. Uh, but I want to try to go deeper and see if there's anything we can point to that causes one region to do better than another, besides just things like geography. Is there anything we can, you know, detect out there that might give us a reason for the differences? I like to use an illustration from my travels to kind of, um, let you know what I'm talking about. I used to do a lot of traveling. And for example, one time I went to Peru. And I remember at the airport there in Iquitos, Peru, when you wanted to get up to the um, the counter where the, the, the people were who took your tickets and your baggage and everything, man, it was just a huge crowd. And to get up there, you had to like elbow your way. And it was just very chaotic and so forth. And I used to fly to Kazakhstan a lot. And it was the same there. And I remember thinking... Um, often to myself, you know, I wish I could tell these people, you know, there's a different way to do things. In my country, we have these, these posts that we have, and there's like this belt thing, and it kind of makes you form up in a line, and you go around like this, and, and it's really a lot more orderly. And so, um, you know, some people would say, oh, that's racist. You just think your country's better. Well, to me, I just think that it's real practical. Some things work better than others. And so um, a lot of, nowadays, postmodern people don't like to say anything's better, especially when it comes to cultures or countries or whatever. They don't want to say anything that one country does is better than another because everything's relative and everything is, you shouldn't say better, just say it's different. But I think that that's kind of foolish. I'm more down to earth and simple minded than that. I think it's very possible and logical to say if something's better or it's not. Like, you know, you can say this restaurant was better. We liked it. There was better service there. The atmosphere was more pleasant. The food served quicker or whatever. The waitresses were nicer. Uh, it's hot. It's more flavorful. It's more healthy. This one's better than that one. That's why some restaurants are packed and others aren't. Right? There's nothing wrong with that. That's how life is. And that's how ca uh, capitalism works, by the way. People that do a better got job make more money. Now, I think you can say one restaurant's better than another. I think you can say one team is better than another because they work better together and they win more games. Or you can say a product is better than another product. That's why people buy one product and they don't buy the other because this one's cheaper or it's better in some other way. And um, so, you know, you can say there's a better way to run a business. These people are real efficient in how they run business. So they, they really got ahead. And these others, they didn't do it right. There's a better way, there are better ways of training your children or, or having a marriage to work and so on. So, of course, there's always outliers. People always want to talk about the exceptions. But 
there's exceptions to everything, but at the same time, you can kind of filter through all that, shuffle through all that, and you can see certain trends and certain things, right, that are just better than others. And I just feel like that you ought to be able to agree with that. Um, and so it related to that, sometime back when I was interpreting for the teachers of uh, YWAM School of uh, Government and Economics out of Spain, one of the teachers or a couple of them were from Switzerland and I was interpreting for them and the, the, the students were in Africa and they were in South America. And so I was doing Spanish and English uh, for both uh, sides. And um, this one teacher, I remember he put up a lot of graphs and stuff and it was really interesting. And it, I, I'll show them on the screen, but you know, a graph has four quadrants, right? There's two axes and so there's the X and the Y or the Y and the X and anyway, so like it was measuring things like material prosperity, but also social and psychological factors like satisfaction with life, a feeling of uh, security, um, a feeling of stability, greater peace and so on. And uh, the thing that was interesting was that all the nations that scored in the upper right quadrant, meaning more like the further toward the right you go in the graph, the more prosperous you are. <clears throat> and the further up you go, the more happy with life you are. And so the nations that scored in that upper right quadrant were all so-called Western nations, Western Europe and the United States. And all the countries that were in the lower level down prosperity wise or satisfaction wise and lower and, and over toward the, the left, <clears throat> very coincidentally, were the ones that, uh, you know, Africa, South America, the very students I was interpreting for, and the Middle East. And so I could just kind of almost, you could see all the students on the screen, you know, it's a big Zoom meeting. And you could actually see the Africans and the Latin Americans looking just real sad and perplexed. And I felt for them because it's like I live in the upper right quadrant of the world. And the, the reason I bring that up is because, you know, people could say, well, who did those studies? They're probably racist. All right, you might say that, but you know what? I found out they're done by a lot of different people from a lot of different perspectives. And I don't think that you can make that case. It's just the way things are. If you think that you can tell, argue that Africa is better off than, say, Sweden, I think you're nuts. You know, if you want to say mystical, some kind of mystical way in which they're better, well, you can argue something like that if you want to, but I think you go and see starving children and you see flies on everybody's faces and dirt roads and poverty and, and, and misery. You want to say that that's somehow equal? Fine, have at it. I don't agree. Some regions of the world just do better than other regions. And um, the ones doing the best, I submit to you and just, you know, argue with me if you want, but check it out. The ones doing the best are the ones that were most highly influenced by the Bible and Christianity. That's the, the thesis. They were educated. They were discipled in the ways of God, even though there's a mixture always and a lot of atheist forces and chaos and Christians who were hypocrites and everything else. The overarching thing that made them better was Christian influence. And so I've been talking about biblical education, and that's why I, you know, that's what I'm emphasizing in these teachings. And a lot of pastors, I think, and uh, Christians in general seem to think that education has nothing to do with the church. Do they believe in the separation of church, uh, uh, separation of, ch of school and state? I mean, they all, everybody says they believe in the separation of church and state, but I think a lot of people believe in the, the separation of, of school and state. Today, Many of us in, in America, for example, we just kind of accepted that education is run by the state. I mean, it's mandatory. If you don't send your kids there, you'll be punished. The government orders you to do that. You have to enroll them in school. And so a lot of people have come to see education as just a thing that's done by government. It's done by the state. It's secular, which means, you know, secular means of this world of time and space. And, uh, of course, in my interaction with many Latinos, I found that some Latino countries don't even allow any other kind of education. And there's other countries as well that don't. Um, there's countries in Europe where you're not allowed to have anything like a Christian school or homeschooling. 
And of course, all the communists and authoritarian countries don't allow anything like that. They are going to teach the kids what they believe in. And that's it. But I got to tell you, friends, I believe that education is supposed to be the responsibility of the parents first, but also of the church for those of us who are Christians. God commanded parents to educate their children, places like Deuteronomy 6. And for centuries, the first people of God, the Israelites, raised their children in the fear of the Lord. And um, as I mentioned in the last teaching, Jesus himself was raised by Jewish parents. He was educated in the home. He, he had to be taught how to live. How, you know, a child has to learn everything from their parents. And then we know they took him to the synagogue, and we know they took him to the temple, and we know that at 12 years of age he was in that temple debating with the rabbis and asking them questions and so forth. So he was educated. And then last time I talked about the, how the nation of Israel was discipled by God himself through his servant Moses and how you know, there, God taught them these principles that we saw in the last video. If you didn't see that one, go back and watch that one. So many things that we just take for granted today. We don't even realize those are powerful, though very simple principles that change a person's total outlook on life, and what they think they're supposed to be doing here. I mean, and it's it's powerful, especially when you consider the the world in which the Israelites lived with this, you know, all the idolatrous nations and the pagan practices that they had. And then, of course, when Christ came, he discipled for three and a half years. He educated. He was the great teacher. And on the day of Pentecost, of course, he poured out his spirit and commissioned his followers to go out as emissaries to disciple the nations. Now, I've just read so many books over my life about, you know, church history and so on. And I'm going to uh, just, I'm referring to different ones. I won't always refer to them, but if you ever want to know about where I get this stuff, you can let me know. I'll show you some pictures of the books and, and mention a few of them. One of them I want to mention is The History of Christianity by Scott LaTourette. It's rather a classic. And I want to read a rather long quote from him. He said that how, how that uh, the first five centuries of its existence, the church was really sorting out theology and was d tremendous things happened in the first four or five centuries. But then he says this over the next six centuries from about 1300, he's saying and for, forward, the peoples of Western Europe, so greatly shaped by Christianity, would dominate the entire human race to a degree that's never been true of any other segment of Christianity, uh, pardon, of humanity. They did this partly through mass migrations, partly through political and economic dominance, but even more in ideas and cultural patterns. Those nations that in the 20th century rebelled against Western political and economic imperialism paid Western Europeans the largely unconscious homage of adopting the science and machines they first developed. In other words, even the ones who hated Western civilization because they were colonized, they paid them homage by adopting their science, adopting their machines, and many of their governmental ideas as well, um, as you see in places like India and so forth and South Africa. Um, and, and, and even, he goes on to say, even communism, the ideology that through Russia sought to supplant um, the dominance of Western civilization. In other words, communism wanted to take over from Western civilization. Some would say they even considered themselves to be the manifestation of true Western civilization. But anyway, <clears throat> they had their origins, says La Tourette, in Western Europe and were deeply indebted to Christianity. He goes on to say how it's mainly through peoples of Western Europe that after 1500 AD, Christianity had a surprising geographical expansion as well. We know about that with Columbus and, and all that, what happened after that. And more extensive than, and he says it was more extensive than that of any other religion in all of history. Now, when Christianity entered and spread throughout the Roman Empire, it was a highly organized civilization, right? Um, and then by the 5th and 6th centuries, it was already kind of passing its zenith, as far as in the Western world anyway. And it, many would say it was actually on the, on the other side. It was on the decline. And in some ways, there, were like nothing, there was nothing new for the people. And some people were really discontented with the Roman Empire and they were hungry for something more. 
There were a variety of religions and philosophies that people could choose from at the time. And, and the Christian faith wouldn't necessarily have been one that you would have said would have won out because um, it didn't seem to have what you needed to attract a lot of followers. I mean, the founder was a Jew. A lot of people despised the Jews and despised the nation of Israel. And it was conquered by the Romans. And not only that, this Jew, Jesus, he was crucified as a common criminal by Roman authorities. And then early in the growth of his church, of course, the Roman authorities persecuted the Christians horribly. So you wouldn't think that kind of a, a movement would ever succeed. However, <laughs> the founder of the movement rose from the dead. And despite all the resistance and persecution, his movement grew and grew. And, and there's reasons for that. The message was accompanied by miracles, for one thing. Miracles, healings, lots of different miracles. The message brought hope. It brought transformation to many, many lives. It was just a whole new way of looking at life and the purpose of life. And it, it brought hope because we're going to live forever. Even if the, our life down here is wretched, we have hope for another life. We're going to live forever with the Lord. And the Christian message offered something higher a supreme God, a God of love, who elevated everybody. And, uh, you know, rich and poor, men and women, children, babies, slaves, everyone was elevated and ennobled by the Christian message. It gave hope. It gave a future. It gave them dignity and value. And so it was superior to all their other religions and philosophies. There were plenty of them, but Christianity won out. And because of that, the Christian faith gained supremacy over all other religions. And after a long process, it eventually became the state religion of Rome. And then it passed on from there to other peoples, including the Germanic tribes who were very pagan, the Norse, the Gauls, the Britons, the Anglo-Saxons, etc. In other words, all the different tribes that would eventually uh, take control over all of Western Europe. But that biblical message, it, it, it penetrated and it transformed that place. And it didn't just transform the religion of Europe. <clears throat> it transformed or began to transform all the spheres of life. <clears throat> For example, uh, and again, you got to realize the context. You got to think about how Europe was when this got started. I mean, it was a heathen place <clears throat> known for darkness, idolatry, multiple gods, violence, and and evil, druids, and human sacrifice, and Vikings, and beheadings, and just, uh, just a dark, dark, horrible place. But faithful Christians went forward and penetrated that. <clears throat> and they began slowly to establish centers of worship and study. There are often monasteries, little, you know, little groups banding together to live the Christian life together. And um, they would, you know, become um, self-sufficient by farming or by creating baskets and selling them or by being carpenters or wool weavers or uh, they'd have vineyards and stuff like that. There were artisans and, and then they would sell their wares to the neighbors and they would gain relationship with them through that and it slowly win them over. And <clears throat> this began to train, change and transform Europe. One of the things that's very simple about Christianity but yet transformative is the concept of work that the Bible teaches. Um, it was very different from what the pagan cultures believed in. In the pagan cultures, you know, working with your hands and stuff like that was undignified. Only slaves did that. Only the, the lower peons did that. But in the biblical worldview, work was honorable. And if it's an honest kind of work, it's honorable. If it, it's pleasing to God, it can be done as an act of worship. And so the, cre the scriptures teach that everything anybody does can be done for the Lord. If it's a decent activity, not a wicked activity, it can be done for the Lord to honor the Lord. And so working with your hands, doing crafts, making baskets, making pottery, uh, farming, these were honorable things. And you should do them for the Lord. You should do them as worship and you should do the very best that you can. Because in the scripture, we see that it's not just priests and kings and prophets who were anointed by God. No, in the scripture, we see guys like Aholiab and, and Bezalel. Remember him? The, the, the two guys that, that uh, they were craftsmen and they made the, 
the tabernacle and all the furnishings that went into it. The Bible says they were anointed by the Spirit of God to do that. And then, of course, we know the Lord Jesus was a carpenter before he began his ministry. And we know that Peter and John were fishermen. And then we know that Paul was a tent maker and he made leather goods. So in the biblical worldview, work was noble. And, and workers could pursue a profession, a vocation, and, and know that it was pleasing to God just as much as a king's work or a priest's work was. And so little by little, work as worship changed the Western world. And over time, this produced advances in things like agriculture, like they developed systems of rotating and altering, uh, alternating the fields. And uh, that would produce more, give the fields a chance to lie fallow and, and become enriched again. And with the abundance that they produced, they had enough to sell. They also did something which was interesting. In Northern Europe, they dug ponds to raise fish in, and they'd have them there for three or four years. Then they drained the ponds and, and then turn that land into farmland because it would be enriched by the years of having the fish there and the fish manure and so forth. And so they produced more. They also, you know, I don't know if you know this, people used to talk about the Dark Ages, but that's been disproved. There's no Dark Ages. I read a book recently called The Bright Ages, and that's the truth. There were lots of inventions and innovations, and life went on. It wasn't a Dark Age. And a lot of these Christian people, monks and so forth, they developed, they developed things like water wheels. They developed that to use them, the energy of water and gravity and so forth, to grind grain. And they, they used their creativity. <clears throat> They channeled uh, things. They knew that God said for us to take dominion over the earth. And so as they were doing this, they began to produce more. And as they produced more, they could do things like specialize. And you could have like uh, stratification of labor. You could have managers and supervisors and you could have workers and they could become more productive that way. And uh, you could specialize like if this area here is better for vineyards, we have vineyards and we grow wine. And we sell that to those people over there and they farm and we buy their produce. They, we trade with our wine and vice versa. And that way everybody can do the best with what they got and let others do the best with what they got. But together, everybody's better off. This is a, sounds like a simple thing, but it's what produced abundance and prosperity in Europe. And, and there were many other developments. Like, for example, <clears throat> people used precious metals for their money. And, and also jewelry and so forth. So you had goldsmiths and silversmiths. Well, they would have to store gold and silver to use in their jewelry and so forth. And also to make coins as they would, you know, governments would print coins and so forth. They'd store it. And so some people would know the goldsmith, he has a place where he stores gold. I'm going to take my gold over there and ask him if he'll store it for me, maybe for a price or something. And so they would do that, store their gold and their silver there. And then out of that came a system where they said, well, look, you know, <clears throat> you don't have to come get your gold and silver and haul it around. I'll give you a note that says that I have your gold. And so this note is worth what the gold is worth. And you can go use that to do your business and stuff and to trade because I have the gold and it, it backs it up, right? The gold backs up this paper note. And that's how paper bills and built bank notes came about. And that's how the lending of money to businesses and so forth came about and charging interest came about. And so <clears throat> banking, that's how it got going. And mostly it happened in northern Italy in a Christian worldview, Christian environment, banking, capitalism. People think today, you know, that socialism is more like Christ. They don't understand capitalism. Of course, there's corruption in capitalism. There's corruption in human beings. So any system is going to be, have corruption and bad sides to it. But the very idea of it came out of the Christian worldview. Socialism did not. Socialism is contrary to the Bible. And, but, but anyway, these things came about. And another one that's very interesting about this time that I thought uh, was interesting was that um, people would send their wares, right? Businessmen, merchants would send their wares um, and, uh, and uh, you know, to other places. And sometimes on the way, the ship would sink or bandits would attack and steal or whatever. So you'd lose everything. Well, somebody got the idea, hey, look, you know, you pay me and I'll guarantee your product. And so if you lose it, I'll pay you whatever it was worth. You pay me a portion. 
And the thing is, I'll get a lot of people to pay me a portion. That way I'll make enough money. So if some of them get lost or robbed or whatever, I still work, turn out okay. Because I collected a lot of money from a lot of people and most of them didn't get robbed. Most of their ships did make it through. So I make money. That's how the insurance industry was born. And so just, just you know, that's what we all have today, insurance. We take it for granted, but it developed in that Christian worldview. And so notice the impact that Christianity and the gospel had on this area of economy. A lot of people don't know that. The economics is something God has a lot to say about. And so it was faith in God and the word of God that impacted these areas of life and in many other areas. And I could spend many, many videos on this. But I just want to br briefly mention right now <clears throat> some of the other areas. But take art, fine art and, and uh, things like that. I mean, think of the impact of the Bible upon art. Leonardo da Vinci's David or Moses statues, Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel, various incredible works of art that, of course, they were paid by the Roman Catholic Church and so on, but that's a Christian influence. And there were Christian themes that were painted by all these famous artists, Rembrandt and so many others. That art flourished in the Christian worldview and with Christian themes and biblical themes and and biblical influence. Think about the area of architecture. That's a whole nother area. You might say, well, they're just, uh, you know, the Roman Catholic Church built all those cathedrals. Yes, but those cathedrals were built to glorify God and for people to come and hear the word of God. And I don't know if you've traveled in Europe at all, but man, you go in and some of these cathedrals, they're inspiring. I was in St. Paul's Cathedral in London and the design of it, you know, it has the four Gospels in, in four different areas and it has the manger prophets and it has so many biblical themes, even in the architecture. And all there's all of these cathedrals and all are fantastic. And then think of the literary works, Dante's Inferno or Paradise Lost or John Bunyan's Progress, uh, uh, Pilgrim's Progress. These books are all with biblical themes. In, in Shakespeare alone, I can't remember right now the number, but there's like hundreds of biblical references in Shakespeare. People don't realize Europe was shaped by the word of God. I went to a place called Little Europe. I think it's near Belgium, if I remember right. We went there and it's like a Disney World place, but it's like you go around and you see this is France and over here is Germany and this is Italy. And you see the different like displays about the different countries of Europe. And in one of the sections there, right on the wall, there's this big, you know, you go and you read all these different things. And there's this thing there and it says Europe was undoubtedly formed and shaped and molded by Christianity. I thought, man, this is like a Disney World place, but they put this in writing right here. Everybody knows it. I'm going to show you a picture of a book here called Dominion that I read some time back. back. Uh, the guy admits he didn't want to say this. He didn't want to say Christianity made Europe, but he, after he studied, he, he was kind of an agnostic. I think he was against, against Christianity. His name's Tom Holland. But in his book, he shows Christianity shaped the Western world. There's just no getting around it. Think of music. Have you ever heard of Johann Sebastian Bach? <laughs> he wrote on his compositions, SDG at the end of every composition, because it means it's Latin for soli deo gloria, to God alone be the glory. How many things were musical pieces were written to honor God, Handel's Messiah, Charles Wesley's hymns. My goodness. Musical notes were created by Christian monks. They invented the system of musical notes. My time's running out. I got to hurry, but I've already mentioned how education itself emerged from the Christian influence. Sure, you had people like Aristotle tutoring uh, uh, Alexander the Great and so forth. You had tutors and things like that before Christianity, but it was for the elite only. With Christianity, there came, there came this idea that, hey man, we're people of a book. The book is God's word. We, we got to be able to read this book to know what God says to us. And we got to teach other people to read so they can know what God has said. And so monks taught people to read and one of the monks, Alquin, you know, Charlemagne brought him over from England and said, I want you to teach me to read and teach our people to read. And I want you to create schools. And he did. And it was Christian people, monks and, and uh, priests and such who taught and who created education, <laughs> broad based education that reaches everybody. It was Christianity that caused that. 
And did you know that when we have, you know, everybody goes to college for liberal arts nowadays, you got a BA, Bachelor of Arts. Did you know that the liberal arts were created to teach pr principles of liberty, libera? That's why they're called liberal arts. And those arts were meant to be teaching you the basics from a biblical worldview so that you could be a better Christian and a better citizen. That's what it was originally for. How far are we fallen from that today? And all the major universities of Europe and the United States, without exception, they're all started to teach people, to, to teach ministers the word of God and train them. But then they all developed eventually into uh, broader based studies and science evolved there and all the scholars evolved there. All the early scholars were priests. Nobody else could be off enough to do their studies. They had to work and farm and so forth. But priests were the ones who were the first real scholars. And then they became scientists. And I don't have time to develop it, but man, read Rodney Stark's books. He talks about in detail how the scientific method, understand again, I'm not talking about there were no brilliant, pe brilliant people outside of Christianity. I'm not trying to say no other civilizations had any brilliant thinkers or developed any brilliant ideas about the, the astronomy or mathematics. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is the actual scientific method itself only rose and, 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 and was born in the Christian worldview. And there's a whole lot of reasons for that. And there's a lot of scholars, both secular and non and Christian, who will tell you that. And I just don't need to argue. What I want to tell you now, I'm just making a statement of fact. Science arose in the Western Christian worldview and nowhere else. Now, there's only time to mention one more area, and then I've got to, I've got to close this teaching. Again, I'm just trying to sprinkle out a few of these things that I've been studying for years to help people who maybe didn't get the chance I got to understand some of the riches that are out there and what, what Christian biblical education has created and why we need to take it back, why, why we need to foster it and, and promote it again in our day. Now, I want to mention this one other area. And that is government. A lot of people say, man, pastor, don't talk about government. Don't talk about politics. That's a dirty business. And of course it is. Politics is a crooked racket. I don't like politicians. I think the worst people become politicians. I understand all that. But let me tell you, politics is one of the most important areas there is because whoever is in political power decides what everybody else, whatever, what the, the rules are for everybody else. So it's extremely important. It affects all other areas of life. And don't you know that when Christians began to penetrate society and, the, and, the, and countries were converted to Christ, don't you understand, don't you realize that cannot but influence government and legal proceedings and legal systems and so on? It's unavoidable. The more people you have accepting Christ and becoming Christian and buying into the Christian worldview, some of them are going to become people who are in political power, positions of power, and it's going to change how they think. And indeed it did. I already mentioned Alcuin. Charlemagne brought him over. He educated Charlemagne. That affected the king, who was, in a sense, the first Holy Roman Emperor. He was Christianized by Alcuin. Of course it affected how he ruled. Guys like John Wycliffe in England in the 1300s and, and uh, Martin Bootser, who, was in, uh, who, who went to England, he wrote to the king of England to tell him what his duties were as a Christian king. And so, of course, biblical teaching influenced systems of government. Did you know Wycliffe wrote in the, for, the foreword to his uh, translation of the Bible into English, he wrote that only through reading the Bible could we ever get to become self-governed and then establish governments of the people, by the people, and for the people? Lincoln quoted that at Gettysburg, but it came from John Wycliffe, a professor of the Bible at Oxford University. And man, you could just go on and on, but you know, Calvin, Zwingli, Martin Bootser, as I mentioned, and all these great leaders of the Reformation, they taught principles of government and law and and uh, representation and human rights that came from the Bible, folks. That's why Western Europe is more democratic. 
and more representative and has greater freedom and the people feel a greater sense of order and law and peace and stability and they're more prosperous that's why but most today don't even know that they don't even know their history they don't know where it came from and they want to actually throw it out because they don't even know why they're blessed they think they're not blessed it's so interesting to me that oh and i'm going to talk about this next time but the american government was so influenced by biblical thinking so influenced and, and you know mo most people don't even know it and even the people at the time didn't know it but they constantly use biblical quotes in their speeches did you know that even our three branches of government executive legislative and judicial all came from montesquieu sure the french philosopher he 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 promoted that but it came originally from the bible isaiah 33 22 where it says the lord is our judge the lord is our lawgiver the lord is our king i mean listen i know our government isn't just i know our government isn't christian i know our government is far far from that i i hate what my government does in so many ways but what I want to tell you is that the original, original documents and the original founding, a whole lot of it was biblically based. Yes, there was slavery. And there were, there were cracks in our foundation from the beginning. And there was corruption from the beginning. And we weren't in agreement from the beginning. I'm reading a book now that talks about how disunified we've always been from our founding. But what I'm saying is anything that was good in our government came from that biblical worldview, that Christian education. And so I got to wrap up. My time is up. But I'm just trying to say, look, this had more of an impact than many people realize. Europe was molded and shaped by Christianity. And I'll close with just this one illustration, okay? I like to show this photograph that was taken from a satellite over the Korean Peninsula at night. And if you look at this, you can see real clearly the north is just outlined there. And, and at night, it's almost completely dark. Whereas the South is brilliant. Now the South was, Christian missionaries went there about 1900 from the United States primarily. And they brought the gospel. And so South Korea is very, in a large way, is Christianized. The largest church in the world is there, the church of Dr. Paul Yonggi Cho. And there are many churches of 60, 70,000 members. There's a tremendous Christian influence in Korea. And I want you to notice how in even a photograph, you can see the difference. And it's literally the difference of darkness and light, night and day. And what makes that difference, folks? What made that difference? Why are they different? I'll tell you, number one, because of politics. You don't think politics is important? Look at that photo. They're totally different polit political systems. Communist authoritarian system in the north, a democratic system in the south. That's a, how important politics is. But secondly... And most important, fundamentally, foundationally, they're different because the South followed a Christian worldview in the North, an atheistic, godless, communist worldview. Friends, that's what a difference Christian education, the Christian teaching and worldview can make. It's time for us to realize where we got our blessings from. And to go back to training and teaching and discipling our children and our populace, the principles of God's word, because it'll make the difference between day and night. Next time, we'll look at the impact the Bible had on America. Till then, may the Lord richly bless you.